create some of our strongest memories. Memories of their days at Auckland Girls Grammar recently brought together thousands of women and girls to celebrate the school's proud record in girls' education over a hundred years. school song suggests, schoolgirl memories can be a mixture of pleasure and pain, but the old girls and present pupils who attended the celebrations came because the school had been an important influence on their lives. I feel quite nostalgic about it because my schooling was really very enjoyable. It also gave me the, um, the ability to go to university to get qualifications so that I could earn a living and, as a woman, have an independent life. And I count that as terribly, terribly important. Before I came here, no way would I stand up in front of a, a crowd and say anything, let alone my name. But it's just given me a lot of confidence just to talk amongst people and to put across my views and what I think about people. I left this place with great admiration for women as scholars, women as professional people, and they gave me the self-confidence that I should go ahead and do the same thing, or certainly set me on the path to do the same thing. Anna, can you give me an example of non-renewable resources? Coal and gas. And gas. Good. And Few New Zealanders today would doubt the importance of educating girls at secondary school. But a hundred years ago, this wasn't such a clear-cut issue. The first girls' secondary school in Auckland was the Auckland Girls' High School, opened in 1877 in Upper Queen Street. But despite these beginnings, Aucklanders of the last century didn't see education for girls or boys as a high priority. The newly established borough of Auckland was being developed as a port and business centre, and the city fathers and tradespeople saw transport, roads and drainage as far more pressing issues. But a grammar school for boys had been set up in 1869 in Howe Street, Newton, with Crown grants set aside by Sir George Grey. When in 1888, as a result of the slump, the Auckland Girls High School went bankrupt, an appeal was made to the Auckland Grammar School Board to take in these stranded girls. Sir George Grey himself, then living in Auckland, lent weight to the appeal and the grammar school board relented. So the 78 girls and their five teachers were accepted into the grammar school, which by then had moved to Simon Street on a site now occupied by the Auckland University School of Architecture. 
The headmaster, Mr Charles Bourne, welcomed the girls to the school, having first established with the board the terms of the amalgamation. He was assured that girls and boys would be taught separately, and that the women teachers, who had no university qualifications, would not be teaching the boys. The girls fitted in well, eagerly accepting all the opportunities offered. Among these first students were some who were later to become distinguished and well-loved teachers. Winifred Peckin, a kind and tolerant woman, remembered for her good-humoured and patient approach, was appointed in 1896 to teach at the grammar school. She was among the first women to gain a New Zealand university degree. My mother went from only hung a high school uh, to grammar in 1904 when grammar school was open, the free places came and she and her brother moved over. And um, of course she was behind and she, Mr. Tibbs was teaching the mechanics and she did very badly, she was bottom I think. And then the next term Miss Pickin took over and she um, took the trouble to explain and, add and fill in the gaps, with the result that at the end of the term, Mr. Tibbs came in and inspected one of those long lists that they used to have on the um, top of all the examination papers. And um, he said, what's this, Miss Perry, top? He couldn't believe his eyes. There was another surprise for Mr. Tibbs, the grammar school headmaster who succeeded Mr. Bourne. In 1907, as the school list shows, Hilda Kirkbride topped the upper sixth and took the senior essay prize. Tibbs put her success down to the chivalry of the boys. At the turn of the century, a few primary school girls went on to secondary school, which because of the expense was largely the privilege of the middle class. In 1903, Two years free secondary schooling was given by Seddon's government to all who passed the proficiency examination. Numbers at the grammar school went up immediately, causing a need for a separate girls' school. Few would link St Paul's Church with the history of Auckland girls' grammar, but in 1906, when the girls were officially farewelled, they were packed off next door to the crypt of the church. Separated by a thin curtain, several classes shared the space. St Agnes' Eve, ah, bitter chill it was. The owl, for all his feathers, was a cold. The hare limped trembling through the frozen grass. And, by and silent was the flock. How many sheep did Farmer C purchase if he took the rest? The fingers well, now, An earthen floor, tall domed ceilings, was heavy pink, old pink curtains, dust-laden, pounds and pounds of dust, and mice running everywhere. I learnt all my Caesar down there, and I associate the conquest of Gaul with, <laughs> with the hordes of mice that used to run about our feet. The first headmistress of the school, Miss Anne Whitelaw, had been among the first 78 girls to enter the grammar school in 1888. She had graduated Master of Arts in Mathematics from Trinity College, Dublin, before becoming a teacher at Wickham Abbey School near London. On arriving back in New Zealand to take up her position, she found the plans for the school still at the drawing board stage, and the girls housed in makeshift quarters. But by 1909, the new building on the House Street site was completed, and opened by the Minister of Education in April of that year. A beautiful day, and sixth form were asked to bring trays, you know, and uh, do all the honours of the afternoon tea party, which we did. And it was simply marvellous to have all this indoors in a beautiful hall, new hall, absolutely unused, and there were pillars at the side of the hall, and I thought, Oh, this is, re this is a school. We've at last come into our own. Even today, Auckland Girls Grammar School continues many of the traditions associated with New Zealand grammar schools, which were themselves based on English models.
Throughout its history, the school has produced a host of outstanding scholars, and all the headmistresses themselves have had distinguished academic careers. In addition, the last three have held office in professional associations within education. When it separated from Auckland Grammar, the girls' school adopted the same motto and emblem and continued to be governed by the Auckland Grammar School's board. At first, the girls didn't wear uniform, but it was gradually introduced and standardised. Later, as more working-class girls gained access to education at the school, this played a significant role in reducing outward forms of class distinction. I think indeed that most of us were proud of wearing uniform. I found the movement away when I was teaching later, and I found the movement away from uniform quite difficult to understand. Um, one of the things about uniform, apart from the fact that you were identifiable, which was very good for discipline, um, was um, that it meant that it narrowed the boundaries between the well-to-do and the poor. I mean, you were dressed the same. You didn't have somebody who owned six skirts to wear to school and somebody else who only had one. But as well as being a symbol of egalitarianism, the uniform came to represent the discipline and order of the grammar school approach. When a girl, whatever her background, put on the uniform of the school, she was entering into a contract that she would uphold its codes of behaviour and take part in its daily routines, many of which were established in the very beginning. A spacious hall in which to bring her school together was what Miss Whitelaw had dreamt of in the Simon Street days. Her wish came true when she greeted her girls for the first time in the House Street building. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, the language of hymn and prayer and the King James Bible became an integral part of every grammar girl's education and assembly readings and talks stressed moral values like integrity, honesty and reliability. The assembly format devised by Miss Whitelaw remained virtually unchanged for 70 years and the prayer she wrote, together with Mr Tibbs, was to be adopted by all the Auckland grammar schools. To begin with, the New Zealand secondary schools had close links with British schools and this was very much the case at Auckland Girls. For example, Miss Whitelaw had taught at Wickham Abbey under the famous English headmistress Miss Frances Dove and like her, she believed in the importance of an aesthetic environment. So she drew up plans to transform the grounds at Auckland Girls from mud and clay to lawn and gardens. Along the drive, she planned a hedge of English roses which was to be planted by her successor. And while Miss Whitelaw began transforming the grounds, she shaped the attitudes of her pupils, giving them a striking model of an independent woman. Very strong. First thing that struck you was her strength. Strength of character, strength of build. She always wore tweed suits. Never any, never any dresses. Tweed suits. Ankle, no, calf length, middle calf length. She had an extraordinarily strong footstep. And I think that was an indication of her whole attitude. Everything was push forward. Fight the good fight was one of her favourite hymns with us. And that seemed to me to personify her whole outlook. When Miss Whitelaw resigned in 1910 to become headmistress at Wickham Abbey, her position was advertised in New Zealand and overseas. Her successor, Miss Blanche Butler, who took up her position in 1911, was an Englishwoman, a science graduate with teaching experience in several girls' schools in England. An attractive and elegant woman, she was adored by many of her pupils, and had created a romantic legend by the time she left ten years later to marry and settle in Rhodesia. I think I've described my first picture of her. She came down the drive on my enrolling morning, uh, because we couldn't enroll the year before, uh, in a long white frock, uh, built at the waist, white gloves, picture hat, I think a parasol, 
and that beautiful skin of hers. Um, people either thought she was wonderful or some didn't like her. I was one who thought she was wonderful. Miss Butler believed in the power of women to change the world, but through the example of their civilizing influence. In the dark days of the First World War, she wrote to the girls in the school magazine. You are to be the expression of all truth and beauty. It is for this reason we are so insistent on your conduct, manners and personal daintiness. For this desolated world will find its beauty where it found its beauty in the days before desolation, in its women. Miss Picken, who succeeded Miss Butler in 1921, had been at the time of her appointment on the school staff for 25 years. In many ways, she epitomised the grammar school teacher of those early days, who taught successive generations of schoolgirls and whose life was dedicated to the school. Just as dedicated, but much more austere, was her successor, Miss Johnston, who was appointed in 1926. She had also been on the staff of the school as a younger teacher. Under her leadership, the day-to-day -day running of the school became more rigid and ritualised. There were even rules as to the way girls were to approach her in the study. You had to stand at the door with just so much of you showing. If there was too much of you showing, then you were being rude and intrusive and you would get a detention for being such a, you know, ill-mannered person. And if you stood with too little of yourself showing, you would get a detention for wasting her time because she couldn't see you. When she wanted you to come in, when you had just the right amount of your showing, she would di you lined up in a queue. She would ding the bell, sit at the desk and ding the bell. And then you went in and you said, good morning, Miss Johnston, and it was Johnston with a T. And if you didn't say the T, you got a detention for not saying sounding the T. And you say, good morning, Miss Johnston, I'm Elaine Brown of 3A1. To her credit, Miss Johnston had high aims for the girls, wanting them to take an active part in society after leaving school by becoming decision makers and leaders. She saw in the prefect system a way of teaching these skills and of delegating to girls some of the responsibility for running the school. But she demanded absolute observance of school rules and gave to her prefects the authority to enforce them, an authority that was passed on to successive generations of schoolgirls. When I was at school, you were not permitted to eat in the street at all for any reason. And while walking home along Krangafi Road one day when I was in the fourth form, I put my hand in my pocket and found a small roll of lifesavers. And I passed one to a friend who said, no, thank you. It was small and it was concealed in my hand. And with that, the current head prefect of the time came up beside me. I said to her, oh, here, would you like one too? Because I'd known her all my life. And I just regarded her as a friend rather than as the head prefect. And she said, no, thank you, but that's going to cost you an essay. By the time Miss Johnston retired in the 1940s, the Auckland Girls Grammar School tradition was firmly established. Many of the values which she and her predecessors affirmed, like honesty, reliability, and consideration for others, are still encouraged in the school, but today the atmosphere is more informal and friendly. As in other schools, there's less enthusiasm for the wearing of uniform, and attitudes to discipline are quite different. My whole concern personally, and that of, I must say shared by many of the staff, has been to teach girls to feel good about themselves, and thoughtful towards others, and to be self-controlled in their behaviour. And that takes time to learn. So the little ones that come in are certainly often more unruly than they were 10 years ago. But at the same time, they learn very much more quickly to be in charge of their own behaviour. The classrooms seem to be a lot more relaxed. The teachers um, aren't as strict. They're more or less your friends here, or that's what I found. They're more or less your friends. They're not just your teachers. They're not just the people that are standing up in front of the class telling you or trying to teach you an education. They're your friends as well. But though relationships between staff and students may have changed, the school's traditions remain surprisingly constant. 
I couldn't help laughing at myself for my concern to make sure that the old girls saw all the cups that we've won this year and all the, all the particular prizes right across from the Latin Cup to the netball, the debating to the Polynesian Festival. I had to make sure they were all on display because we're just as centred on achieving excellence as the, the school was right in its beginning and has been all through. And it's quite a competitive sort of excellence too. It is beating others as well as achieving personal best. It's titled, I Paint What I See by E.B. White. What do you paint when you paint on a wall? Said John, dear grandson, Nelson. Do you paint just anything there at all? Will there be any doves or a tree in fall? Or a hunting scene like an English hall? While competitions of all kinds continue in the school, there have been modifications. As is common elsewhere, the day no longer begins with the school assembly, and the format of the assembly has changed considerably, to the regret of some who remember the old days. Well, I think sometimes the changes uh, are not always for the best. I think the assembly in the morning, first thing before the girls went off to classes, may have had certain disadvantages, but I think the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Uh, to come into a hall all together as a group, uh, to sing all together as a group, to have the announcements made so that you really knew what was going on in a school as a whole group, I think are exceedingly valuable because it seemed to set the pattern for the day. during recreation periods without special permission from the Assistant Educational and Recreational Manager. Though there may be a few external signs of change, one thing that remains unaltered is the girls' sense of pride in the school and sense of its history. The pupils, I think, were actually asked a lot of to help um, with the celebrations, giving a lot, a lot of their spare time and, and their energy. And, um, and I think the school spirit really shone through just during that week especially. While the Auckland Girls Grammar School traditions remain unchanged, its schoolgirl population has changed dramatically. Today's students represent over 40 of the different cultures living in Auckland, and the school recognises the importance of expressions of cultural identity. Māori girls of the school today may greet students from other Auckland schools with all the ceremony of the past, but with a confidence their mothers and grandmothers didn't necessarily show. Last century, it was only the European middle class who could afford to send their daughters to secondary school. But with state funding came more working class girls. Few non-European girls went on to secondary school and in 1915, Mabel Mangakahia from Tolaga Bay was only the second Maori girl to attend Auckland Girls Grammar School. There were also few girls from other races a situation which lasted another 25 years. By the 1920s, the school role was rapidly growing and girls came to school by every available means of transport. Some from St Helia's by boat, um, many by train, particularly from the North Line, uh, Avondale and beyond, they came into the Mount Eden station. Um, and they had to scurry to catch the train after school at night at attention to them. Uh, was a bit of a trial. Um, by tram, and I don't think anybody came by bus in my day, but by tram or a few by bicycle from really all over Auckland. By 1917, the role had grown so big that an annex was opened in Silver Road, Epsom. But senior girls from the area continued at Auckland Girls for a further two years till Epsom Girls' grammar became independent.
along with many other commuters, girls from the North Shore suburbs of Northcote, Birkenhead and Devonport made the twice daily journey across the harbour until 1927 when another grammar school was opened in Takapuna. By the 1940s there were more Māori girls attending the school and though they settled in well, few gave any thought to their sense of isolation. I felt like a little mouse, all these strange people. None of them spoke Māori. So I kept a low profile and I figured very much in sport, you know, because when I came into the first form, nobody knew me, but at no time I was picked to be games captain because I could catch anything, hit anything. And in cricket, I never knew where to throw to, or what to do when I batted, you know. And the changeover was a fascinating sort of exercise. I used to think, oh, well, peculiar things Pakeha people do. <laughs> Until 1943, fewer girls than boys finished three-year secondary school, as some parents were reluctant to educate girls beyond primary level. But legislation raising the leaving age to 15 gave girls, on the face of it anyway, the same opportunities as boys. The beginning of real change at Auckland Girls came in the time of Miss Rua Gardner. Appointed in 1945, she was an old girl of the school. Progressive in outlook and a champion of girls' education throughout her life, she took special interest in Maori girls and girls from other cultures encouraging others to do likewise. The first day I arrived at school, she welcomed me very warmly and she made me feel at home. And she took me to the assembly and she introduced me to the whole school uh, by my first name, Cantha. And ever since that, I have remained Cantha to my friends, although my name is pronounced Cantha Madhuji. I'm afraid she never mastered my surname. <coughs> she could never pronounce my surname. And the girls in my class were just wonderful. They were very supportive, very encouraging. They included me in everything. Um, it was a very warm feeling. As more schools opened after the war, the Auckland Girls Grammar School zone began to shrink. At the same time, the character of central Auckland was changing. It was fast becoming a multiracial society, and girls began to have quite different needs but the school continued a policy of integration, believing this was best. There was no conscious level of race, really. There, there wasn't any division, there wasn't any emphasis put on differences, there wasn't even any uh, need for striving for a unity here or unity there. there. There just were no differences. In Miss Louise Gardner's time, the zoning issue came to a head. Though no relation to her predecessor, she, like her, was an old girl and one who knew the school well. When appointed headmistress in 1967, she'd been associated with the school for over 30 years. In 1971, the Education Department reduced the zone even further, paring away an area it had shared with Seddon High School. It meant zoning away from um, the school people who were within walking distance and people who'd traditionally been in our zone and it caused a great deal of trouble. People, uh, the non-Europeans in the Ponsonby Rail in district uh, felt that they were being discriminated against and uh, the uh, people, uh, the um, Europeans who had valuable properties in Hearn Bay found that their property went down in value because people did not want to send their children to a co-educational school and to a school which they did quite wrongly at that stage uh, regard as a, a technical school. But the zone remained unchanged. When Miss Gardner retired in 1978, nearly half the school was non-European and many girls spoke English as their second language. So we were facing the influx of people new immigrants coming, particularly from the Pacific. The school had a fine, strong academic tradition and it could have easily turned into an inner city ghetto school. But she fought for the school all the time. She fought to keep its standards. She fought to keep uniform for the image of the school to be good in the eyes of the community, for um, her girls to, to aim for the best. Um, she refused to make any allowances 
for the fact that these girls couldn't speak English when they came here or anything. They were all her girls and they would all do the best and she would treat them all equally and she was right. Miss Gardner held the school here. She had the support of the old girls and of a whole network throughout Auckland of distinguished business people and professional people. And she maintained the standards for which the school was known. And she maintained them with absolute conviction in their rightness and in her own rightness. Now, if it hadn't been for her, there would be no Auckland Girls Grammar School here. In the last five years, six of our staff have received national educational awards. Miss Charmaine Poutney, the next headmistress, had a strong foundation on which to build, but faced challenges unprecedented in the school's history. Educated at Epsom Grammar, she was familiar with the Auckland girls' traditions, but she gave the school a new direction and vitality. Through her example, staff and girls have learned not only to accept cultural difference, but to integrate it completely into the life of the school. New Zealand women have always been as eager as men to play sport, but facilities available to them as girls at school when their interests have been developing have often been inferior to those in boys' schools. A survey of playing fields and grounds in girls' and boys' schools in 1930 shows girls' schools greatly disadvantaged. The situation at Auckland Girls was the same. Today's schoolgirls are as eager to play sport as girls in the past, but there's always been a struggle to provide adequate sporting and physical education facilities. As with sport, so with many other facilities. The original school, built for 350, soon became inadequate. Buildings were added, repaired, and as the money was raised, rebuilt. But the school changed little until the 1940s when a new block was added but there was neither gymnasium nor swimming pool until the late 1950s. Many of the present school facilities have been provided through the support of the Old Girls Association, who organised the reunion weekend. Formed in 1911, they have raised money for countless school projects, including the new hall. The Dorothy Winston Hall, big enough to hold the whole school, was named after one of its most distinguished Old Girls, and one who almost single-handedly raised the money for its construction. The support of other volunteers, like the PTA and the Friends of the School, has also been invaluable. Years of delay by the Education Department and the difficulty of the site meant that until the 1970s, when a major building program took place, girls of the school endured conditions greatly inferior to those enjoyed by other Auckland schools. In 1978, pressure on facilities was further eased when the Beresford Street School closed and Auckland Girls acquired its grounds and buildings. Though the school board lent support over the years, in 1987 a new Auckland Girls Grammar School board was created with many advantages. We do have more women on the board. We are also more culturally represented than we have in the past. We also have a position uh, for the Tangata Whenua and that's really important for the school. Co-opted members, we've been able to hand one over to the Pacific Island community. So when the whole makeup of the board now is very representative of the makeup of the school, both gender and um, racial mix. And I think that we also have European representatives. So it's very multicultural and really exciting to work with. Dog one's called K, the other one's called A. There have also been changes to the curriculum itself. 
Today's girls can study a range of subjects undreamt of by their mothers and grandmothers. It takes a bit of practice, doesn't it? Bonjour, Oli. Bonjour, Doya. In the beginning, English, mathematics, science and languages formed the basis of the curriculum. And these subjects continue today, though teaching methods now differ greatly. When the girls finally moved to Howe Street and had their own laboratories, there was more opportunity to study physics and chemistry, but this didn't last long. Though Miss Whitelaw believed a strong academic education was the way forward for girls, she was also mindful of the social roles girls might play on leaving school, so she lobbied for the introduction of a domestic science course. Though today's girls can study this subject along with the other sciences, in 1917, when domestic science was made compulsory for all junior high school girls, it ironically replaced most other science teaching apart from botany, a situation lasting many years. In the early days, teaching was one of the few professions open to women with degrees, and like Miss Dive and Miss MacDonald, many went back into the classroom on graduation to teach future generations. In many ways, they weren't good teachers. They hadn't been to training college, you see, but they, their characters shone through, you might say. For example, Miss Hull's way of teaching Roman history was really funny. Um, she gave you the next three pages in the book to learn, and then she went round the class, there were only nine of us, asking questions of these, these <laughs> these pages it was never a, like a subject of the, the first Punic War or something like that. No, it's what the next three pages held. Sally Heap, appointed in 1906 as the school's drill mistress, trained many young teachers in physical education as private pupils. They in turn took her methods and approach out into other schools. But the drill, a far cry from today's physical education, emphasized precise and graceful movement and reinforced attitudes about the importance for women of good deportment and carriage. Another teacher whose influence went beyond the school was Miss Lena Bruce, appointed in 1915. Miss Bruce taught drama in many Auckland schools when the subject was in its infancy and was remembered at Auckland Girls for her productions of Shakespearean and Greek theatre. Art has been taught at the school since the very beginning, and over the years the art department has encouraged the development of many New Zealand women artists. During the educational reforms of the 1940s, suggested by the Thomas Report, which laid down a core curriculum, art, like physical education and music, was given more time and status. But in many other ways, the situation at Auckland Girls was abreast of current thinking. art, music has a long tradition in the school. Choirs and orchestras have sung and played at school assemblies and functions for many years. Many young women have thought from the time that they were little girls, if only I could be the Prime Minister, I too would change the world. And the one example we have of that, of course, is Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> A better world. Generations of girls have come through the school practiced in the art of public speaking and debate. Part of the English syllabus of the 1940s, these skills are taught today. What we're hoping for, what we're really praying, is that any small steps we might take will be appreciated. Though the syllabus focused on English literature, little attention was given to New Zealand writing till the 1960s. Really and truly, there wasn't very much to be in evidence. Uh, I've, I've studied uh, the history of New Zealand writing and we didn't get, we didn't get our breakthrough in poetry, into poetry worthy of the name, until the late, very late 1920s with R.A.K. Mason. We didn't get, except for Catherine Mansfield, whom I emoted over like anything at school, um, we didn't uh, have short, good short stories until the 1930s. We didn't have a crop of good novels till the 1950s. The school has always had a strong reputation in mathematics, and girls are still encouraged to excel in the subject. But some courses prevented girls from taking full mathematics and limited them in other ways. 
there was an incredibly limited range of things that you could choose from and they were very much the, the traditional subjects um, but that didn't strike us as particularly odd at the time, it was just what you expected and what you were presented with. Um, there were battles to get simple things like to be able to do, I think it was in the sixth form, to be able to do um, history and something else together. I mean it, it was actually difficult even within the rigid number of subjects that we had to necessarily exercise all the choices. So, but you just accepted that. At first there was only an academic course, but in 1922 a commercial course was offered, which gained a high reputation. Until recently it had some serious drawbacks for girls who couldn't take commercial subjects beyond the fifth form. With my commercial background, had I been given a few more options, I might have looked at those and at least I could have made a decision. But I felt I had no decision in what happened to me. I felt that it was fairly much a predetermined line for me to go and that was that. In 1925, nearly half the girls leaving school went back into the home. With them in mind, a general course was offered. Of those entering work, there were few career options other than nursing, teaching and office work. A situation lasting many years. There was very little idea of anything outside those things and in fact we knew nothing whatsoever about the world of work and we were not taught anything about it. And we, we, it was dimly understood that we would marry and have kids and be mothers at some stage in the future. But that wasn't really emphasised, that was just a, a, a taken for granted underlay to everything and we were not taught how to combine the two. They spent their day shopping and cooking in the kitchen. In social studies, girls can now gain a clearer picture of what they're likely to face on leaving school and learn something of society's past expectations of women. But until more recently, a feminist perspective has been missing from the school curriculum. On the other hand, you've got an enormous feeling that women were extraordinarily competent. There was nothing that women couldn't do in terms of running things and it just never occurred to you to question that women didn't do these things. I think it's a wonderful thing when you've got a school like that where so many women uh, feel they owe it a great deal. You see the number of people that spoke to me at, that, at those celebrations about different teachers, different ones, not necessarily headmistresses. And even in your own way, you, you realize that, uh, that a teacher in a good school has got a terrific influence. As well as providing strong role models of professional women, the school staff have had influence well beyond the classroom. They've introduced girls to a whole range of extracurricular activities, which have often given them lifelong interests. But it's been the social changes of the last decade which have made some of the greatest demands on them. During Miss Poutney's time, the school has faced rapid change. To meet these demands, new programs have been offered and greater emphasis placed on preparation for life. The streaming system, which limited some girls' options, has been dismantled. When I arrived in the third form, there were still pretty much um, ranked classes. Um, you know, even though they had the form names, were the form names of the teachers, we all knew who was in the top class and the bottom class and everywhere in between. And that was pretty much there. Also, like, my classes taught French and Latin and that was the way we went. And there wasn't a lot of scope to take anything else if you wanted to do an ac academic course. And by the time I left in 1985, that had changed quite a lot. While the introduction of new courses and the abolition of streaming reflect current trends, there have been real innovations under Miss Partney. Perhaps if I could just pick on two or three areas in which we have certainly been at the forefront. One would be in the work on success-oriented learning, on the quality of teaching and learning and the role of assessment in that process. There's still, unfortunately, at secondary school level, very few people really basing their teaching on the assumption that all students are capable of achieving excellence and attempting to teach and test and reteach to make that possible. Now we're only doing it in some departments and on a small scale, but most schools are not doing it at all. So that would be one area. Alongside that, the development of really good achievement-based assessment 
procedures. One area that I'm particularly pleased about but can claim no credit for because it wasn't the doing of any of the Parkhouse staff has been the development of Māori language immersion course. This course enables Māori girls to do most of their learning in the Māori language. In programs like these and others available to all girls, the school is confronting the issue of race relations, placing value on cultural identity. In meeting the need for change, the school has always been able to maintain its traditions. We have these immensely traditional things like flower shows and poetry readings, but yet we have things like Māori immersion classes and things like that. So yeah, the fact that we've kept adding on, but we've held on to the good things from the past too. And, and in researching it, and, and researching some of the women who had taught here, just to see the amazing visions that they had, like Miss Whitelaw, the first principal, she, she just had visions that must have been well, well out of her time. People must have thought her really strange, and yet history has caught up and shown that she had really good, innovative ideas. A hundred years later, the school is still at the forefront of girls' education.